Luke chapter 5, we see the, the disciples working all night. Um, I'm sorry, let me go back a little bit further. This is a, this is a different scenario. They weren't all working all night. Where as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word, that he, as he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. So, so let's just pick, pick this up, first of all. They, they had been out fishing. They were washing their nets. The, the nets needed to be free from the salt and everything else, and so that they were all ready and, and folded up ready for the next, next fish, fishing trip. Um, it then says... Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, as we go on, we see what, what many people have, have hailed as, as, uh, as Simon's great faith uh, step. But, but we see that Simon did what God, what Jesus told him to do, but only halfway. Uh, he, he was told by Jesus, let down your nets, plural. But what we see later on, as we, as we get down here, um, let's see, Luke chapter 5, verse 5. But Simon answered and said, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And sounds great, doesn't it? At your word, Lord. I will let down, but listen to what he says next, the, the net, singular, the net. Now, I, I don't want to take away from Simon's faith. I, I, he was stepping out as far as he could at this point. I, 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 I applaud him. I mean, you know, he's been work, he has, they have worked all night, you know, and, and they've washed, they're washing their nets. But now we, we see Jesus say, now, Put out a bit further, go out into the deep and cast out the nets. In other words, Jesus is talking about the same ones he's just washed. The good ones, the ones that you use for catching fish. So, so Simon must have just grabbed some old thing that didn't need to be washed again. And Listen, it's no wonder later on we find out that the net begins to break. Do you think it was God's... Do you think, do you think Jesus is going to cause... The blessing to come upon you that causes damage? Think about this for a second. No, no. The, the, the reason the nets began to break was because the, the instruction wasn't followed through on to exactly what Jesus said to do. So I do applaud Peter's faith in that he at least was willing to push back out into the deep and he was willing to cast the net out there, but... It was a little half-hearted in that he didn't really do what was supposed to happen there. And uh, so, so as we, where are we? I've gone again. Here we go. So Simon answered and said, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. When they had gone from this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. Their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them and they came and filled both boats and they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, now this is interesting, he fell down at Jesus' knees. Uh, hang on a second, biology, you know, heads and shoulders, knees and toes. Hang on a second, how do you fall at someone's knees? You can fall on your knees, but how do you feel? Let me, can, I, can I just get, paint the picture for you? They're in a boat full of fish. Do you get it? Can you see it? He's up to his knees in fish. So the only way for Peter to fall is that Jesus, he can't fall at his feet. They're covered with fish. He can feel at his, fall at his knees, which means Peter's being slapped in the face <laughs> by all these fish. <laughs> can you see the picture here? Sometimes you've got to look at what it says. <laughs> So Peter's being reminded <laughs> that you didn't do this. And had you obeyed properly, we would have maybe had even more. And it would have been an even greater miracle. Now, now I want to just draw back into something. 
uh, for this. I want to just, just now, it seems like it's the simplest of words, but, but where I believe God wants us to go. In verse 4, launch out into the deep. The deep. Launch out into the deep. Now, now these fish are going to obey Jesus wherever Peter puts his nets. I mean, he could have said, just launch out two feet, launch out into the shallow. It really didn't matter. But, but Jesus said something very specifically because he wasn't just talking to Peter's fishing abilities. He wasn't just talking to where the fish were at. He was talking to Peter about, about something far greater than that. How far are you willing to go out on a limb? How far are you willing to go out deep for me? It could have been anything, but he said, launch out into the deep. Now, the word for deep is a really interesting one. It's, 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 an, it's a super, super simple word in the Greek. But it also, when you dig a little further, has a, has a, 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 a surprisingly deep meaning. I mean, the simplicity, the simplicity of it is simply that the word, the word deep is the word where we get our word bath from. It's bathos. And we, you know, when you, you, it, when you have a bath, you, you, you don't want a two-inch bath. You know, if you're going to have a bath, you have a, a bath, right? You want it deep. Uh, and uh, often the, the uh, ritual, Jewish ritual cleansing was uh, much more akin actually to the Japanese baths where you go, it's like full, full length, you know, um, and, and you go right down into a mikveh bath. Um, so, so out into the deep. But listen to what the Greek word is also. This word can also be interjected into a sentence to imply uh, the extent or even it by uh, figuratively the mystery. Isn't that interesting? Launch out into the mystery. What's a mystery? A mystery is something that hasn't quite yet been revealed to you. But it's there. It just, you just haven't, you haven't gone deep enough to understand this yet. The mystery... The deep and the depth. So, so Peter is, is at this point still functioning as a commercial fisherman and Jesus is giving him, him an instruction that not only is going to meet his needs on a practical level and set him up financially to, to, uh, to be part of his personal staff for the next three years so that his family is completely taken care of financially. But he's also giving Peter an instruction to obey through faith and to put out nets, multiple catching vessels. But he only puts one out. And he doesn't quite, doesn't quite get what was supposed to happen. Now I want us to understand the parallels of this. The, the Lord tells us to launch out into the deep. Get out there into what you don't know yet. Let me lead you. Let me take you out there. I know you think you know what you're doing. You're a fisherman. Now, now as far as they're concerned, they're looking at Jesus. He's a rabbi. He's a rabbi. He's, he's got his rabbi robes on. He's on the beach. He's on the shore. Now, I don't know about you, but, but you know, can you imagine, can you imagine uh, a, a pastor walking onto a building site and telling the builder, hey, now, let me tell you how to build that wall. <laughs> Can you imagine? Now, mate, uh, I just want to give you some instructions. Just get, get your plumb line for a second. The, the builder's going to say to me, uh, can I see your ticket? <laughs> can I see your builder's ticket? Because until I do, I'm not taking any advice from you. Would, would that be fair to say? I mean, so, so Peter's got Jesus on his boat. He's, he, Jesus is, is there to... To minister and, and so forth. And, 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 and so he just turns to, to Simon and he starts telling him how to fish. Put out into the, into the deep. And th this actually happens a few times in, in, in these situations. Even after Jesus' resurrection. <laughs> hey children, have you caught anything? You know, I mean, it, cast it on the other side. Well, well, Jesus is telling him, get out there into the, into the deep part. And cast out multiple nets. If they've got two nets in there, listen, it's everything. It's the whole lot. Those boats aren't that big. I've been on a, I've been on a Jesus boat. I've, I've, I've have. I've, they've, they've got reproductions. Um, they're not that big. 
So when you're talking about a, a, a few guys, uh, you've, probably, you've probably got two massive nets, one that gets cut, you know, or they get cast over where the school of fish is and they pull them in and they fill the boat and they go in. Um, so it probably is also, I don't know this for sure, but representing everything. <laughs> get it all out there for a, for a net catching a, a, a large blessing. And, and, and no, I don't think it was supposed to. We, we talk about net breaking catch and, and I, 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 I'm all for that confession. Yeah, a net breaking, in other words, more than we can handle. I get that context. But I don't think God wants the things that you're using for his, for his glory to, to, to actually be destroyed. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now, now you are an important vessel. You, you're, you're a net. You're a fisherman, but you're also, you're also a vessel. You're also a tool that God wants to use for his glory, and he doesn't want you broken. Now, now, now hear me on this. This is important. When we do what God says to do, but we do it our own way, we find ourselves getting broken. Are you hearing me now? Because what we suddenly introduced was a natural flesh angle on what was a spiritual instruction. Can you see that? Jesus made it quite clear. Cast out into the deep and throw out the nets for a catch. Peter went out into the deep, got that, superb, but got the net and added his own angle to this. Now the grace was that they still got the harvest. They still got the catch and they called some other people over to, to help with it and uh, they filled up both the boats and, and so forth. So the, the grace of God was operational there but, but you know, he went back to shore with a broken net. We don't, he doesn't want you to come back to shore broken. He wants you sustained in the way you can handle the glory, handle the ministry, handle the things that God wants you to do. Even, yes, handle the money. You can, you can get an instruction from God as to what to do concerning your finances or your vocation and so forth and so on, and, and you can go out and add your angle on it, and you may get some success, but you can end up being broken within the context of how you handle those finances. Can you see what I'm saying? We don't want to add our spin to what he says. We, we, we can begin heading out into the deep in the spirit, but we can end up in the flesh. Now, that, that's, the Lord just downloaded all that to me in about three seconds as we, uh, from earlier when we were in prayer and stuff. Now, I want you to go over to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And the message we're looking at here is... Um, the realignment of change. The realignment of change. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, or, or another way of reading that accurately, just as accurately, is where the Spirit is Lord. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, and where the Spirit is Lord. He has got to be Lord. Amen. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is a, li there is a liberty when you're following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That's where liberty actually exists. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed or changed into the same image. Well, what image? You can't, you can't be changed into the same image as you. That wouldn't be any change. So the reference point then is Jesus, correct? The Spirit of the Lord, the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. You're being changed into that image, into the image of Jesus, the glory of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord. Those are the, those are, that's the context. So beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from, and here, here, here now we see it confirmed, glory 
to glory. Whatever glory exists in you as a born again believer, and there's glory in that, by the way, there is a greater dimension of glory for you to be transformed and changed and, and developed and transformed into. The thing we've got to understand here is that this is not stagnant. This doesn't stay in one place. This, this, is, this, is, a, this is moving. This is uh, progressing. This, is, uh, this, this doesn't just stop. There's nothing stagnant about this. There's nothing stationary about your transformation in your life right now. I don't, in fact, I think because there is no end to God, there will be a no end to getting to know God. There'll be no end to getting to experience and understand His glory. There's going to be a continual uh, for generations and millennia. There are going to be more and more every day. Worship's not going to be difficult in heaven, folks, because you're going to each day see a whole new dimension that you hadn't seen before, and it's going to erupt on the inside of you, and you won't be able to help yourself praise and worship and glorify God for what, for what you just saw and you, the revelation you just got. Amen. My goodness, come on. Yeah. Now, now, that doesn't start the moment we're raptured or the moment we go to heaven because we breathed our last breath. That, that began, that point of revelation began the moment you got born again. That's when your eyes were open to see some things from a completely different place. Up until then, it was purely on faith that came to you through the message of the gospel that you latched hold on to. The spiritual transformation exploded on the inside of you. And that moment, the, your spiritual eyes opened and you started to see glorious things. Amen. Now, from a baby's perspective at first, yes. But as we develop and as we Change. How many of you know that it is necessary for a baby to change yes. and progress? Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. I mean, we've, it's just a natural thing. We look at the babies and, and uh, you, know, um, you know, babies make noise at times. Mm -hmm. This happens. They are hungry, they are, wanting, they are wanting something, and they make a little squawky noise as we just heard a few, few minutes ago. All right? Now, <laughs> that's natural. We kind of get that. It's a baby. If Beck started doing that, <laughs> I'd get a little bit annoyed. <laughs> if she started sitting there going, meh, 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 and, and, you know, and that was her cue to Taryn to give her something to drink, <laughs> you know, something's wrong here, right? I mean, there's obviously been progression, <laughs> Right? There's been a progression, and we would expect that, there, that, that Jeremiah is going to progress and grow and develop, and, and eventually, you know, there's change. Well, it's the same for us. And, and, and we, we've been given and deposited a, a powerful thing on the inside of us, a, a born-again new creation spirit. But there is progression. There is change. Now, when we resist the change is when we get stuck in religious activity. When we get, then we get stuck in, in soulish attempts to live out our Christianity and our revelation. And we can even get stuck on one level of revelation, which was not designed to be uh, just a foundation. It was designed to be a stepping stone. Now, now I, want, I want you to, to get this with me. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. We could say one degree of glory to another degree of glory. Never, it, that, that is never referring to a lesser glory. I mean, even, even when I read that, no, I don't think any of you would have assumed, well, that could have been in either direction. No, we're always going to assume because, because if we've known the Lord for five minutes, we know that He's got better for us. He's never putting us in a position where He's going to withdraw glory from our lives. He always wants to bring an increase in glory to our lives. Amen. That's his desire. As parents, you always want better for your kids. You want them to develop. You want them to grow and so forth. Now, 
And again, it says and reiterates, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So again, referring to the Lordship of the Spirit in our lives that we, that we, we bow to, that we yield to, that we allow to lead us. Um, another scripture that we've known and quoted well that gives us an understanding of this progression, Romans 1.17. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Okay, again we see a hint to the process of revelation. Revealing. How? From faith to faith. You see that? Faith to faith. You, you don't stay on one level of faith. Faith is developed and increases in, in your capacity to function in it and understand it and, and use it just as it, is, as, it is, as it is written, the just, referring back again for in it, the righteousness of God, the just, the righteous, shall live by faith. So that, that then gives us an understanding that this is not a Sunday thing. This is not an annual conference thing. This is an everyday, every moment kind of an existence where we live by this faith which is in progression from one degree of faith to another degree of faith. Amen. Are you getting the picture here? Am I painting it clear enough so we can see that there is nothing stagnant about this? That stagnancy starts to smell. Stagnancy becomes putrid. When we stay the same and we lock into the same, it doesn't matter how good it was when it was fresh. It doesn't matter how good it was when it was new. The problem is that it's going to stagnate. It's going to smell. It's, it's old. It doesn't matter how fresh that bread was last week. <laughs> if, you're try, if you're going to cut a slice for yourself today, if it's real bread, <laughs> you're not pumped with preservatives, it's going to be green. It's going to start mold on it. It, it, it started out. It started out, it, it, you know, looking good. Um, but it's no good anymore. It's just been sitting there. It's not been used for the purpose in which it was created. The kingdom of God is an ever upward and forward momentum. I want you to understand this. The kingdom has a momentum. It has a momentum. There is, there, is a, there is a move. Even right at the very, very beginning, if you go to the first couple of verses of the Bible, uh, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. Then look at the picture of the Holy Ghost and the, Holy, the Spirit of God was hovering. Even though he's not actually doing anything yet, there's this kind of momentum even within himself. He's kind of like... He's kind of hovering. He's like... He's like waiting for the word. And as soon as that word comes, he's bang, he's into action, man. But the Spirit of God doesn't stop. Even the light that we just talked about, even the let there be light that, that actually is said next, light has a continual momentum. There is, there is no breaks on light. It just goes and it goes and it goes. It just never stops. Unlike sound, which dissipates over distance, light doesn't. It just keeps on going. It keeps on going. It keeps on going. It keeps on going. That's why, that's why uh, people tell us, well, you look at a star, you can look at a planet today, uh, and it's taken, you know, uh, 67 billion years for that piece of light to get from there to here. And you think to yourself, well, how's that possible if the earth was only created 6,000 years ago? Well, it's not impossible for God to say, light from here to here now. I mean, okay, just fix that. I mean, that's God. We're talking about God here, right? If He can create planets, He can tell the light from that planet to be something that would naturally take 67 billion light years to get there. He can tell it to be there in an instant, all right? Just in case someone's trying to persuade you otherwise. But, but, I'm, but one, what we need to understand is that that light just keeps on going. It doesn't have a shelf life. It, it's got a momentum to it. Uh, it it, it's, it's powerful. But the, but the kingdom is that, well, God is light. And he's, he has a momentum to him as well, in that sense. It's, it's not now, now here's what we need to be careful of when we think about change and progression and transformation. It's ever upward and forward momentum. So 
So it never, never in regression, it never goes backwards, it never falls and it never fails. But it's not so much only a natural progression, although natural laws will often respond to and follow spiritual law. So I want you to start now twist, just changing the way you think about what I'm saying to not just natu the natural progression of things. things. Things have natural progressions. Things have natural changes in them. But I want you to start to understand that there is a supernatural or a spiritual transformation. Now, first of all, that, that, com that was a complete transformation of your spirit when you were born again. I mean, it's not even, you can't even compare the two. You're a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. The old is gone, it's dead, the new has come. Amen? New creation. New created speaking spirit just like God. Now, the development and progress in, in the spirit can't always be determined by what is perceived by the natural senses. So there can, be a, there can be a lot happening and progressing and changing in the spirit that isn't always immediately perceived or understood by the natural senses, the sight, the sound, the smell, the taste, the touch. So that, that, can, be, that can mean there's a lot going on that if we are only looking at things in the natural, then we're going to completely miss what's really really going on. And of course, we're told that in 2 Corinthians 4.18, and we've used this verse over and over again, while we look not at the things which are seen, for the things, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So what are we looking at? The temporary or the eternal? So we're talking about the eternal. The eternal is what's got that never-ending, uh, no, no limit potential and momentum attached to it. The natural on the other hand, has a limit to it. The natural, on the other hand, has a shelf life. The natural can stop. In fact, in fact, as soon as the natural stops, what does it do? It begins to regress. It begins to die. You know, someone says, well, I don't like change. Then die. <laughs> because, because anything that is not, uh, is alive is is actually progressing. It, it needs to, to be alive. Its, its, its cells have got to be doing something. There's got to be progression. The, the, if you chop the limb off a branch, you stop, yes, you stop the change. That branch will no longer grow out anymore. It will no longer change and progress and it, in, in, its, in what it's... But, it will, but, but it, you can't just put that branch now on the wall and, and isn't that a lovely branch and aren't those lovely leaves? It's the, mi the minute you cut it off, it started dying. It stopped changing in the direction of the momentum in which it was supposed to go and it was cut off. So and you can look at it this way. The blessing stopped flowing through, through its, its, uh, its sap, through, through its life source. And once you cut off the blessing, once you cut off the source, once you cut off the spiritual source, what happens is you end up with the curse. The curse is not in and of itself powerful. It's the absence of the life that was feeding the limb. Can you see that? So when we see the curse in the law, the curse is not empowered. The curse is a descriptive of what life looks like without the blessing. If you do this, blessed shall you be, blessed shall you be, be, be. If you don't, if you cut off the blessing from your life, cursed shall you be. That's not God empowering curse in your life. Do you understand this? God, God is not cursing you. He's describing what the curse is, which is the picture of the opposite to the blessing. That's how that works. Hallelujah. Well, if we think about this, then we want to be on the blessing side. We want to have a life, the life of God flowing through us, progressing us. And if we have the life of God in us, if we are tapped into him, if he is the vine and we are the branches and we don't disconnect and get cut off, then that life flow that comes through us is going to cause growth and change. OK, that's just how it is. That's not always comfortable. Every now and then, uh, uh, my, my wife, sort of, we, we're in bed and she, she makes this funny little noise. And I'm, what's going on? I've got growing pains. 
I said, sweetheart, you're 53 years old. <laughs> but, well, that's what my dad used to call them, she says. She does every single time. That's what my dad used to call them. But, and, and so she, when she was a little girl, she had, you know, she had, gro you know, the, you, have, you remember growing pains when your limbs are growing and, and it's just achy and so forth. And, and she'd say to her dad, well, dad, my legs are hurting. He'd say, well, sweetheart, that's just growing pains. And so Jill still calls them that today. Um, I don't know, maybe she is still growing. <laughs> it's the same pain. <laughs> but the thing is, we, 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 it sometimes growth then, therefore then causes a bit of discomfort. You know? Um, sometimes, it, it, sometimes it even looks a little awkward. You know? Uh, we, we go through stages in our life. We go through, uh, you know, t times when we... we we, suddenly, you know, we've been this little child and all of a sudden our, 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 our ears are bigger and nose is bigger and our teeth are bigger than the rest of us, you know. <laughs> and we haven't quite grown, and then, we grow, then we grow into them, well, some of us do, uh, <laughs> grow into them. Um, but but it, it can be awkward change. I mean, look, just we're talking about puberty. Puberty can be a very awkward phase of life, you know. There's all sorts of change going on, uh, you know, in, in, internally and and everything else. But hey, this is a natural progression. It's necessary. It's necessary. So the kingdom of God is very much like this, where there's a development and a progress in the spirit that, that can't always be identified uh, straight away uh, from the outside. But there is change that's taking place. Change when it comes in the life of a believer or a ministry is not so much, now, now I want you to hear this, not so much change of direction or vision, but a progression, the next step up. Now, what a lot of people make, and what, what's happened if you study history, church history, uh, especially you know, in the last thousand years, um, when you study that and you look at that, what we see is that people changed People were a part of a movement or a change, a progression in the spirit, but they actually kind of almost worshipped the change and the revelation and camped on it. It became a foundation stone instead of a stepping stone. The, now, now the, the other side of that is... They, what happens is then they resist the next step. They, regress, they resist the progressional revelation. Can you see that? Of what, now, now here's, the, here's the thing though. Sometimes what people do is completely, to get there, they think they have to step off this one. You can't leave that behind. That's the step to this one. And I've seen this. I've seen this, in, in, unfortunately, in, as I've observed, uh, you know, recent church uh, movements and history and stuff, either one, one uh, group will camp here and they'll put, build a wall around their, their stone and they're not going anywhere from there. And they're not open to any kind of progressional revelation on what they've got. Or someone that will see, see revelation over here and, and, and sort of get off of this and, and now actually criticize this. Because they, they're over in this revelation. No, if you've actually progressed properly, you can't criticize the, the stepping stone that you got off because you know how you needed that to get here. If you find yourself criticizing the last thing that you believed, then you haven't, the progression's wrong. You haven't changed correctly. Is this, is this making sense to anybody here? So, so we see this going through. We, we, that's why I, I love to study revival history and, and church history and, and look at the things. Not because we were looking at it to go, oh, the good old days, we want to go back to that. But because we can learn from, from both the successes and the failures of what's happened in church history. Some of the greatest revivalists in history ended badly because they got stuck or someone locked them in somewhere. Some of the greatest revivalists in history. One of, one of, my, uh, one of the, the revivalists that I, I've really enjoyed studying over the years, a man named Evan Roberts from the Welsh Revivals. Amazing young man of God and, and uh, really a young, a young man, really young man, who, who cr was crying out to God and he would walk the streets in Wales just praying as a young person. 
And uh, it, it, there, there was a powerful moment, just to give you just a very brief history, but a powerful moment where he wasn't really given anywhere to preach and he was eventually given a, a youth service to preach in and, and, and just the Spirit of God came and just started to move so strongly. And it came at, at first with a call to a place of brokenness. And, and what he said, and it's old English, we don't use this vernacular today, but what happened was Evan Roberts cried out, God, bend me. Now, we would probably use the word break today. And now you think, well, why would, why would God want to break you? Well, he doesn't. He wants, to, he wants your, you to have life. But there are things in our old us, the soul, that the whole way we've been thinking, the, the, the limitations that we've encrusted ourselves into, that God does want to break off of you. There are things that, of your old life that God does want to break from the grip on you. And he, why? Because he wants you to be free to follow hard after the, the destiny that God's called you for. Some people are walking around with a great big backpack on it and half of it's filled with rocks from their old life, half of it's filled with some, other, some theological rocks just to boot to make you feel better, but it's all weighing you down and you can't run the race that's set before you. And you're going to throw that weight off. Well, then we go, do I need to throw away religion? Yes, throw away religion. Just don't throw away the Word. Yeah. Throw away what's encased you and trapped you in something that isn't liberating. Doesn't, In fact, it, it, you can always tell, it doesn't lead you to increase if it's religion. It keeps you encased and held back. So God has changed of direction or vision, but it's not that it's the, a change of direction or vision. It's a change that, that redirects to the original vision. So, so there is a progression. So if I want to, if I'm born and, and God has put on me a destiny to be, uh, let's say, a police officer. Let's just pick some, a, a vocation. Out. Let's say God wants me to be a police officer and to, and to, you know, and there's a whole dynamic in there that God is wanting me to do and part of my call and destiny and I'm going to lead people to Christ and I'm going to say, raise the dead and, you know, I'm going to do all sorts of things as a police officer. And I'm born that way. I can't do that if I stay a baby. I have to change and progress and develop and mature to step into that vocation, correct? And it's the same with us as Christians. So there's going to be, at t now what happens was the change and the direction of, of, of what I'm learning and, and everything else makes these course adjustments to keep me on track because we try to think in straight lines, but often life does not come in straight lines. It, it, it and, and and sometimes what happens is, and as you, as you get older, and it's funny saying that these days, um, now I'm in my 50s, <laughs> but, but life has got this great big funnel that incorporates a whole lot of stuff and direction uh, as you start out. It's very broad in your Christianity. And why? Because actually God needs you to experience a lot of different things within the context of where He's taking you. But as you start to grow and change and develop in your Christianity, that path starts to narrow. It starts, it starts to get narrower. And it got, starts to get more specific. And the things tell, God tells you starts to, starts to bring into a place of dynamic focus where they've done all of these things and seen all of these things and experienced all of these things. And I'm sure, I mean, if you're anything like me, there was a time in my life, in my, in my 20s and early 30s, man, I've, I, I was starting to think, I was starting to think, am I, am I schizophrenic? Am I, am I just chopping and changing? What's, what's going on here? How, how, you know, what's happening here? I, I, I seem to be changing my mind every five minutes. You know, about what God was saying. Well, no, no, no. When I look back at it now, I do see that actually there was a progression yeah. in the things that I needed to learn, yeah. the things that I needed to understand. And I was changing. Each step changed me. It, in, it increased me. It gave me wi uh, wisdom or knowledge or training or understanding. This is important stuff, folks. So even when we are corrected by God, 
and repentance is necessary, it, it's still a, a turning away from something to something. It's, a, it's a re, just a redirection. It's a course direction. Now, now there's repentance that's necessary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we're not minimizing that. And, and there are times where there are things that are just plain old sin. But there's also, that you can also repent from weights that aren't even sinful. Until God tells them to get rid of them, then you don't do it, then it becomes a sin. So, at times it's not necessarily blatant sin that got us off course. Now, you understand, sin by itself, missing the mark, not living according to, to how God wants you to live, sin is going to cause you to, is, is going to, cause you to, be, to veer seriously off course. We, we all understand this, don't we? Now, we know that Jesus has paid the price for our sins. We know that's, that's done. We, but we have to, but if we do sin, then all we have to do is appropriate, in the same way you appropriated your salvation, before one minute you weren't saved, and yet Jesus paid the price for you 2,000 years ago. But you're not saved, but he's paid the price. But you're not saved, but he's paid the price. <laughs> the moment you appropriate that by faith, you receive what was done for you 2,000 years ago. Now it's yours. The same way you do this, maybe on a daily basis with your health. Well, if you wake up and you've got a runny nose, you can't deny the runny nose. You've got to appropriate the healing that was done for you 2,000 years ago by faith. Amen. Well, the same thing is with sin. If you sin today, if you think bad thoughts, do bad things, then you appropriate the forgiveness that's already been extended to you and paid for you 2,000 years ago. We do that by faith in the same way we do everything else. Amen. Now, repentance is change. Think about this. Repentance is not simply a turning away from, but, but directionally means an, a turning to. We've looked at this before, right? You can't, you can't change direction without having some direction. You, you, you turn away from something that's damaging you and sin will always, that is what's going to function the curse in your life. Even though you're redeemed from it, it's going to cause the blessing to be blocked. And when the blessing, the, when the blessing is blocked off, when the, the life flow of Zoe, life of God, is blocked off, the curse starts to operate, which is simply everything breaks down. No, it's not working for you. It's, it's, it's curse. It's lack. And so forth and so on. So, so what we do is God corrects us. He brings the word. If you're, if you're humble enough, he'll allow, you'll allow someone to speak into your life and, and bring a course correction. Now, we don't let just any old, any old person speak into our lives on that level. We, we tr we, there's trust and there's authority and responsibility and so forth that happens. And, uh, but we, in one degree, we do submit, submit to one another. In that, in that context. But, you know, you don't just allow everybody to walk up and, and challenge you and, you know, correct you and so forth. I, I, I've not found anybody yet that I've tried to correct that they didn't ask for it that would thank me for it, you know. Um, but, but what we've got to do is, is we've got to understand that when that correction comes, be it by the Spirit of God directly or by, uh, through a spiritual point of authority or whatever, it, it's a challenge to change. You, you, you're going to have to... Someone's saying, well, this is, what, this is happening. Well, you're going to have to change this behavior then. Well, that's, that's happening. Well, then you're going to have to change what you're saying. You're going to have to challenge what you're listening to. That there's going to be some change that's necessary. I saw a mem, meme, mem, Meme? I don't even know what they... What is it? Is it a meme? Is it a meme? It's a meme. Okay, I saw a meme the other day. And uh, I thought it was interesting. It was really on the nose. Uh, you know, it, it said, don't tell me what they said about me. Tell me why they were so comfortable telling it to you. Ouch. And you look at a situation like that and you think, yeah, actually... That, uh, that's pretty true. That's pretty true. It was not so, not, the big deal is not so much that they were saying bad things about me. How come, how come they were so comfortable telling you about it? 
Well, what happens when you change things like that? What happens when people start to try to tell you, hey, did you hear? And you're like, whoa, hang on a second. Do I need to hear this? Oh, yes, you do. Well, what's it about? Well, such and such did. Oh, hang on a second. What, what good would telling me this right now do for that person? Well, nothing, but you'd be in for some juicy information. <laughs> now, you, you know, you're going to have to put a stop to it right there. No, no, I'm not, I'm not interested in hearing that. I'm not in, now, immediately that person gets upset. Why? Because they feel, they know now that they're not supposed to even been enjoying that information themselves. Now, you, may, you, you, you potentially lose friends at this point. <laughs> but sometimes change like that is necessary. Sometimes they're not the friends you're supposed to be spending all your time getting information from anyway. Amen. Now, that doesn't always come, by the way, in the, in the flesh and blood version. Sometimes that comes in magazines. Ladies' magazines that are full of gossip and so forth and so on. And, you know, apparently Jennifer Aniston's been in, you know, been married about probably 20 times, if you're going to believe all that sort of stuff. I don't know that. I just see a face on the cover. I don't know what they talk about. But, but she seems to be on there so many times that you, how, is, is, you, you've got to wonder, is anything even remotely true in those magazines? Probably not. Probably not. But people sit there every day and they, and they receive that gossip as, as some, some level of truth, and, and then it, it influences. Do you hear what I'm saying? There's, there's all of this. You don't have to be sitting next to a person for gossip to be in your life. Just turn on the news. You know, the bias and the slant that's often from that concerning, especially Israel and certain things like that. You're not going to hear truth. You're going to hear a slant. You're going to hear a, you know, you have to work hard to get accurate news these days. Um, uh, one, one wise person told me once this, how do you know the difference? Uh, you know, should we not just hear anything about anybody? And he said, no, that there is a difference. The difference is this. You can, you can receive information about someone only if you have the power and authority to do something to help them with it. If you have no influence or authority or power to do anything good for that person in their life, then you do not need to hear that information. And you put a stop to it. But if there's a point of authority that you have in that person's life, an ability, some way in which that information is going to enable you to bless them and to, and to lift them up and to exhort them and, and take them higher, then that was worthwhile information that that, that source had the right to share with you. Can, can you see the difference? Man, if you'll just take that little bit of wisdom, it'll shut down a lot of conversation. Because the only reason for listening to something about somebody else would be for the, for the goal of edifying them and building them up. That's love. Amen. Praise God. Why? Because we, we, we are over in the flesh. If it has no forward momentum progressive to it, then it's flesh. If it can serve something in the Spirit so that we can pray and exhort and meet a need or, or do something in that particular what, you know, essence, then it's, it's progressive, then it's probably got ties to the Spirit where you're going to be able to draw from to be able to do something with that information. Is this, is this coming across? I know this is very instructional, but man, this is, this is so strong on my heart because, because God is leading us, I believe, into a time of change. Both in terms of our church, but... but that will happen because of the change that happens inside individually where we, we leave behind some of the stuff that has entrapped us and encased us in some of the fleshy, soulish stuff and we've got a liberty in the Spirit that takes us and develops us and progresses us internally so that we can step into a, a, and, and be redirected into something that God is longing for and looking for. The short way of saying it is this. God wants his church back. He wants a, a purity of worship and praise and prayer and word and, and interaction, relationship, family. There's something that God invested in all of this. 
There's a song that we sang a little while ago, um, uh, and I can't remember all the lyrics now, but one line sticks in my heart, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Do you remember that? Coming back to the heart of worship. And, and I don't remember all the lyrics of it, but, but there was, I understand the context of that, but let's now put that in, a, in the context of what we've just said. I'm going on to the heart of worship. Because sometimes people want to, if things aren't so great, what we do is we go back to where it was comfortable. Now, the only time I can, I can say is that, that going back is worthwhile is if you're off track and you, you need to find out what the last thing God said to you was. Because sometimes what happens is life becomes hazy and fuzzy and directionless because we, we actually haven't obeyed the last thing God said to you. And guess what, folks? Until you do that, he's not going to say anything else. So, so sometimes we go back to, but really, if we understand this context and the way that's, if we, if we say it that way, we're actually describing it from a soul's perspective. If you get over in the spirit, what happens is you're not going to go back to it. God says, now, go forwards and on to it. And he'll just, that, as soon as you do that, you've repented and it's in your future and it's in your destiny and you are back on track. You're not regressing into what God said. You've just put what God said as your focus again and now it's become your future. Can you see this? It, it, there's a change in the process of how we handle some of these things. And even within Pentecost, uh, Word of Faith, uh, different things, you, you hear, I hear too many people talking about what used to happen. Now, I, I'm inspired by watching old brother Hagen stuff and, you know, videos and stuff and, and, and Oral Roberts and I'm inspired by seeing that stuff. But that's not my future. That was a stepping stone that faithful men and women stood on to get us to today. And, and what we're on today, we need to step on to what's next. Now, I don't doubt that some of the things that will happen may look like some of those things. But they will be on a higher level to a higher degree. They might sound different. They might, you know, we talked the other week about there's, there's, there's new sounds to be heard. Yes. You know, we talk about chord progressions and, and different things. Well, listen, there, there, are, there are progressions we haven't even understood yet that, that will come out of a place of the Spirit and, and, and it'll be almost like how would we ever survive without that? <laughs> Because the sound that's coming forth it actually needs that. Now, you, 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 as musicians, I, I'm not a musician, so I, I'm talking into the air right now, but I'm talking out of my spirit, so hopefully it's landing on people that are musicians. Because I, I know it in my spirit. Hmm? Rings true. Rings true, yeah. Yeah, it rings true. It harmonizes. And, but now take that into other facets of life. There, there are inventions. You know, when we look back on stuff after something's been invented, we, ha we, don't, we, can't, we haven't got a clue how we ever survived without that thing. You know. But until we had it, we had a, a form, we had a, another way, but now we were able to step onto this. There are things in the spirit that we need to understand like this. Faith to faith, glory to glory. The, again, the title, the title of this is the real realignment of change. So the chain, changes that happen, that the Spirit of God leads you in, is always going to be for the forward momentum and lead you toward the mark of the high call. And the mark of the high call is not just your success. The mark of the high call ultimately, so if we can just jump all the way to the end of the sermon, which we'll come back to in a few weeks, and we're going to come back in, the ultimate high call, the ultimate journey, the ultimate destination is intimacy with God. Amen. That's, where, that's where it all ends. Not the success of your ministry, not the, the how many people are sitting in the chairs, not how many, the, the ultimate, when Paul said, I press toward the mark of the high call in Christ Jesus, he was, what he was ultimately talking about was to know him and the power of his resurrection, the intimacy with God. That, that's where it finishes. That's the conclusion of it, ultimately. Hallelujah. But on that journey, there are many course corrections and changes and adjustments and shifts in the spirit that happened that we have to follow. 
And we've talked about this before. And again, this is even within the context of many different things, especially in terms of worship and praise and leading, the leading of the Spirit in a service. But in, when we looked in Ezekiel, wherever yes. the wheels turned, wherever the Spirit went, the wheels, you know, there was a, it, was, it was like absolute. There was, no, there was no disconnect between the directives yeah. and the response. And so this is, this is what I believe. Now, I'm, I'm re, what I'm doing today is I'm releasing these things into your spirit. I'm, I'm releasing seeds, spiritual seeds in you because it's 12 o'clock and I am not even started yet. <laughs> I'm releasing seeds in the spirit, into your spirit, that I believe God wants to water and germinate and grow and, and develop because there is destiny in this room. There are things yet, there are things yet to be done that you will do that will make all of your life up to this point even seem pale in, in, in insignificance. I'm serious. I believe it with all of my heart. And, and that's not to discount the value of all the things that you've done up to this point. It's just that the progressive flow and increase of what needs to take place now is going to take you into a level that, that everything else has, has come together and accumulated to bring you to that point. But... The glory of where you go and what happens with that is just going to seem like, I, well, I'm, I'm thankful for that, but man, I, that doesn't even compare. The intimacy of what you discover next in his face, you can't, you're not going to even be able to remember what you used to think he looked like. Can, can you see what I'm saying? I mean, there's stuff yet to do. We, we you know, I did, Didier is retired, technically. But I just know in my spirit, what's next in him and for him is going to make all of that stuff just even hard to remember. Are you hearing me now? I'm serious about this, folks. It's almost going to be compounded and compacted like the value of a moment in what God is doing by His Spirit next is going to even seem like more time than all of that time. We're going to transcend that stuff. So I'm, I'm going to have to close my, my Bible here. The only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read a prophecy that came forth through, through myself when we were praying uh, on Tuesday night. Was it Tuesday Tuesday night? Tuesday night. Yes, it was Tuesday night. We spent some time praying because be I believe God's instructed us to have a Tuesday night prayer, prayer meeting. And we're going to go there. We're not going to do it just yet. In a few weeks' time, we're going to launch that. We don't know all the details of that yet, but anyway, we just started to pray, and I've instructed the elders, just start praying. Tuesday nights, just start praying. Pray, just start praying for, praying for the prayer. Because <laughs> it's not just going to be the nat what the person thinks natural concept of prayer. It's going to be all of this. It's going to be just a, a, the, the, a flow in the Holy Ghost and words that come forth that are working with the Holy Spirit. And that might be in tongues, that might be in a natural language, that might be in song, it might be in whatever. But this is going to be a flow. And, and so this is what the Spirit of God started to speak to me as we were praying. It's quite a ways into our prayer time on Tuesday. First of all, nets into the deep. Then more of a move of God, prayer move. Redefine what church is beyond the limitations that man and religion has placed on it. Remove the barriers, remove the barriers, open the gates, dig the wells that have been stopped up. Not to get the old stuff, the new stuff. Do you understand? Tap into the divine destiny that comes from heaven and pray from there. Forget the former. Change is not a change of direction. It is a fulfillment of direction and destination. 
Just as the Lord led Israel into the wilderness and led by fire and, and by cloud with manna as they entered the promise, it was different. Man, think about that. Fire, cloud, manna, miracles every day. But that wasn't the promise. When they stepped into the promise, that all stopped. It was change. It was different. And that, but they had to enter in. It was different. Their lives changed. Not a different vision. It was always where they were supposed to be going. But there was many course corrections over 40 years because of their own choices. And God had to keep bringing them back on. Not a different vision, but arriving into the promise. That's what the Lord said to me on Tuesday night as we were praying. I want to encourage you in this. Receive these words as seeds. We're going to, we, we'll, we'll get more into this. I, I pray for me. I believe actually part of what I'm saying now, I'm going to... I'm instructed to say to the leaders, to the pastors, in two weeks' time in, in the ICFM, one of the sessions that I've got uh, along with Patsy Caminetti, I believe the Lord's going to have me say some of this stuff and say it really strong because there's some change that's necessary. And uh, I want you to, as a, as a body, would you pray for me? because I'm the vice president of that, and I might not be after that message. <laughs> well, no, no, by faith, I believe it's going to be well received, and I believe change and the things that God does and says necessarily will be done. But receive this for you right now. Receive this for you right now. Receive and let the Spirit of God start to speak to you and move you and adjust you. And yes, maybe correct and even rebuke but let him lovingly bring that grace to step up to every, every course correction and every aspect of change and development that's necessary in you right now. Amen.